Hey everyone, welcome to my show, Friday PM. My name is Luigi Scarcelli. Uh, we got a great show for you tonight. I'm here with Derry Rundlet. Hi there, good to a, see you. A veteran of the station, uh, a gentleman who's had a show here for a About few years. About 20 years, 20 years or so, yeah. 20 yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, so you know this place like the back of your hand, right? <laughs> I love this place, but I also enjoyed the place that you are well aware of up on Oak Street when we first began. Right, right. That was my favorite. I know I like this place a lot. I like the way you've set up the lights here today. Yeah, it's a, it's a great studio. So uh, I just wanted to get a chance to talk to you a little bit about your life. Uh, your career, your life as a lawyer, uh, just kind of get into it and see see what we uh, mine from it. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> probably not much, but anyway. Uh, uh, well, first of all, I, I was born right here in Portland, just up the street, and, uh, and spent my elementary years here until my father passed away in 58. And I, I've said before that I used to eat in a restaurant right across the street, that you and I were at the very spot. And uh, it wasn't a Chinese place, it was a drugstore. I used to look across the street at this building. I never dreamed that my lifelong dream of having a TV show would be across the street from that spot. That was literally within weeks after my father passed away. And then I moved to Orlando and went to Bowdoin College. Went to Bowdoin. So that's the first 22 years right there. Right. Well, we're going <laughs> fast through it. So you were at Bowdoin College. Yeah. Uh, I know that that was an all, all men's school yeah, at the time. Yeah, Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. I, never, I didn't realize how much I, I thought that was a good idea at the time. But I remember <laughs> sitting in class going, so how come I don't hear a feminine voice now? What's the <laughs> and it was a little strange for me. I liked it a lot, though. But yeah, it was all male until 71, and they went to uh, co-ed. Now they are completely 50-50 co-ed, and it's a wonderful school. And there was no teachers that were women. It was all men teachers. No, that's all right. Men. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, uh, that's another major flaw, in my opinion. Right, right. No, they were, all, they were all male professors. And I think you had said that there was like the Sons of Bowdoin. It was kind of a... Oh, yeah, that was, yeah. it was a song, Rise, Sons of Bowdoin. Right. Oh, they, they don't sing that song anymore. They right. changed the words, Rise, People of Bowdoin or whatever. They had to change a few things. They had to change a lot of things. And I have to tell you something, uh, for the better, it is wonderful to see that school, the, the women's basketball teams and the sports teams and all the stuff that they're doing. I mean... I'm very pleased to see Bowdoin as a co-ed school. It's just a, yeah, it's a great place. Very and, good. And so you, you were at Bowdoin, uh, then you jumped from Bowdoin to Humane Law. Well, before, between that, though, I, I, I graduated from Bowdoin. I had to go in the service for a while. Correct. So I had a, 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 a stay period, and I went to work for Channel 6 Television, an account, account executive. But I wanted to be on the air. Right, right, so right. Trust right. me, they didn't want to put me on the air. <laughs> they were happy with me out selling TV time. Uh, and then, and then I went to law school and, 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 and ended up going to Maine. I was accepted at other schools, but ended up wanting to be in Maine and, and went to Maine. I, and I loved Maine Law School and made a lot of good friends. So let's go back to that. Uh, you were in the service. This was during Vietnam. Yeah, but I, I was in the reserve, so the, the closest I got to Vietnam was California. Right. I, I didn't like being in the service, I'll tell you, yeah. Luigi. I was a, <laughs> I was a, <laughs> I don't know how want to describe myself. Well, the movie Animal House. I, I was a, 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 a having a fun time at Bowdoin. Right. And, uh, and I, I, when I got in the service and started cr crawling in the dirt and shooting weapons and pretending to kill people with knives and bayonets, I tell you, I was, I was so far, it was out of my league. But you can't, you can't, you have to play the part. Well, because you had said that, uh, that at, when you were undergraduate at Bowdoin, whether or not that was even the time of the war, when you were in law school, there was no way to get out of being in, in the draft That's in law right, school. That's right, because when I was at Bowdoin, you know, first went to Bowdoin, if you went to law school, you got deferred. And then that changed when Vietnam. You could, they could get medical school deferments, and I think being a priest or something, or a minister, uh, possibly a teacher, but not law students. And they even said on TV, by the way, are you guys thinking you're going to go to law school? No, nope, you're going to be drafted. And that was, they were doing it by the number, right. birthday, lottery. And so I, w I was very fortunate. Uh, 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 somebody called. I was on the radio at Bowdoin. I was doing a rock and roll show. Somebody kindly called me when I made a joke and said, there was a reserve in open. I don't know who that person is, but I would give them, I would give them a lot of money today if I ever, if ever I found them. them. <laughs> yeah, really, seriously, if you're out there, if you're out there, give me a call. Seriously, I, I, owe, you, I owe you a solid, as they say. And so you had said that uh, after the time of being in the service, that's when you started your career as a city attorney, is yeah, that correct? Yeah, I was assistant yeah. corporation counsel. That was my official title. And, and I was fortunate then because John Monario was city manager, and he was a wonderful man. And there was a wonderful counsel, Leslie McVane, on this uh, TV studio. Her father was on the city council. So I was fortunate. Mm -hmm. that really, 
really good people on the council, and I, I, I did most of their trial work and their labor, labor litigation. So I, I got to be in the courtroom a lot, uh, you know, representing a, you know, a nice client. I mean, the city was, city was almost always right. Uh, <laughs> so it's easy to represent somebody who's probably trying to do things right. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so you worked for the city, and, and was that about when you decided to go into private practice? Yes, yeah, I was there for a few years and went into private practice, and then, you know, became a member of a trial firm, and we handled everything to do with the courtroom, divorces and criminal cases and personal injury and civil litigation and probate litigation. I remember that you had said that at the time, I mean, you got pretty well known as a trial lawyer. Yeah. I had described you when we were talking before as the tough lawyer, but that's not exactly. <laughs> they, they thought of you as the very meticulous well, lawyer. Yeah, well, first of all, when you're a young attorney, it was, it was sort of nice to be known as a badger or a go-getter or whatever, a barracuda, whatever those names are. Because you're, you're doing a, a lot of cases that are coming in your office, and you've got to handle whatever Right, it is. exactly. But no, then later I got, very, you know, getting a personal injury where I represented uh, plaintiffs that have been injured. And, I took it very seriously because you're representing victims, and I did a fair amount of divorces. And so, yeah, I, 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 I tried a lot of cases, and I was proud to win the Legend Award with uh, Terry Gani, my dear, dear friend, and also co-host on my TV show here. Uh, and so, once you win that award, it's like winning the Nobel Prize. You feel like, uh, and you know, it's just, it's just such an honor. So, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, I know a lot of lawyers. Uh, are more involved in dealing with insurance and settlements, yeah. but you didn't mind getting into the court and kind no. of duking it out. Well, let me put it this way. <laughs> you, yeah. you, you should be trying to settle your cases, because you, when you settle your case, your client doesn't go through all the difficulties of a trial. You know, they, they don't like it. They, they, it's not fun to be in a courtroom if you're the, if you're the, uh, the, the client. The lawyer, we're used to it. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's like being on the stage. But, but not, it's not a fun experience for, for the average person. And, and so you try to resolve your cases, and we have a, a process in, in, in place now that's wonderful. It's called mediation. And most ordinary cases sh sh will settle in mediation. Now, catastrophic cases like medical negligence and product liability where there's a lot on the line, those often have to go all the way to trial. But in the early days, though, we were taking small cases to court, 10, 20,000, 30,000, 50,000, and you could get a jury trial, and you're 32 years old. Right. And now, first of all, there are very few civil jury trials now because of, of COVID. And so they've all, they're all backed up and they're going to get them more. And so I feel bad for young lawyers these days that are not getting into the courtroom and trying jury trials. I, I got to try many jury trials in my career. Not as many as some attorneys, but quite a few. And uh, it's, it's quite an experience. But I was fortunate because I had, uh, most of my cases, I had good clients and good cases. So, but I, I thought that what the audience really wants to learn more about is is your career in TV and your, and and yeah. some of the interesting folks that you've met. That's where we wanted to take this discussion. Yeah, a that's a, bit. that's a, that's a long answer, but I can just tell you, this place it became my dream come true as a child. As even when I was in college, I wanted more than else to be on TV. I wanted to be like Johnny Carson, whoever you want to. I don't care who you name, right. game show host, whatever. And that's when I went to work for Channel 6, and it, that, that was, I was not in their minds, and I didn't really ask to be on the air. I kind of hinted at it, but I said, I, oh, I did apply for the job of weatherman, and they didn't even give me that. But, uh, so uh, I'm very fortunate to have a, a law partner, Ken, whose wife came up with the idea, and he came up with the idea of a show called Law on the Line. This is 1999 or something, 22. And so we had lunch with Tom Handel, and the next thing we know, we're doing that show together at Oak Street. And Ken Elshul was my first co-host, and then he went on to bigger and better things as a you know, co-host of the most listened to talk show in Maine. And then, uh, and so I kept the thing going, and then it became the Derry Runlet Show, and now I got that and me on five. And uh, it's, to me, it's a, it's a very fun experience. But I have met some good people. Yeah, uh, I like to always drop the name of F. Lee Bailey. Uh, I had the last interview with him before he passed away. I'm very proud to know him. It was by coincidence that I would have had that last interview, but but he was, a, a, in my opinion, a wonderful guest. And and then you got the governors of the Baldacci and Mills. I've had them them on, and uh, Brenda Lee, my friend, who sings "Rocking Around the Christmas Tree," and Don Campbell, and God, I've had. I, I once there was an ad in the paper, and, and all the people I've had on the show, and. 
I just I've been so, so fortunate. You're, you're, you're going to enjoy this so much. Well, it's just it's just a good joy. Yeah. There, there's nothing more fun than talking mm -hmm. to wonderful people. Right. And well, seriously. So you did have. We talked about that. You had the last ever interview with F. Lee Bailey On before TV. he passed away. Yes. F. Lee Bailey, well known for O.J. case. Or wasn't he involved in something like the Son of Sam way back when, or some kind well, of? Well, like, the Boston Strangler. Boston I'm not Strangler. sure if he was in Son of Sam, but Patty Hearst, and of course, he had many, Patty Hearst. many stars, many stars that he represented over the years. But those were the ones that people remember. And, and of course, the Fugitive was based on his case. And, right. But no, he had hundreds of cases that people probably never would have even heard about. But. And, were also big cases. I mean, it's safe to say that F. Lee Bailey is probably the first celebrity lawyer, in a sense, where he became well, also. I, I, you, you say, uh, what about Abe Lincoln and John Kennedy? But I, I have said this on my on my show, and I'm going to say it on this show. I consider him d to be the greatest uh, trial lawyer in American history, bar none. And I, I'm throwing in Clarence Darrow and everybody else you want to put in, John Adams. And it's primarily because of all of his accomplishments, not just the major ones, but you know, his life as a pilot, all of these things that he did, all of these, uh, his incredible work with, in civil rights. One of his best friends was Harry Belafonte. And so he's not only defending people, whatever, but he's also uh, advocating the right cause, uh, the rights of people, the rights of trial by jury and stuff. And uh, just was uh, I was just very very pleased to know him. I went to his memorial service with, with Rob Baldacci and Steve Schwartz. I'll tell you something. I, it was just it was a wonderful experience to hear really nice people say nice things about him. Wow. And he got criticized and vilified, and, and for, not only for O.J. but he had some problems with the bar. And and uh, I consider it a travesty that he never became a lawyer in Maine, but that, that's, a, that's another story for another time. It's a story interview. for another time, exactly. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. And, and he, I know you talk fondly, is it Brenda Lee? Is that, yeah? She is a very dear friend. She called me last week and, and left me a voicemail singing her hit, hit, uh, hit I'm Sorry. Mm -hmm. She's, I met her on a rock and roll cruise in 2014, and we just became friends, and then my wife and I went down and visited her, and then we went to Las Vegas with her, and then I went. We went on a cruise with her, and then we've uh, been to Atlantic City with her, and so and and we've been stayed at her house in Nashville, and she's a one of she was the she was the number one female singer of the '60s. Really? No, yeah, yeah, she was yeah. the number one female. Only the Beatles and Elvis Presley beat her in terms of record sales, and uh, then she went into country. So she's also the only singer to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and the Country Hall of Fame as well as the Rockabilly Hall of Fame. And of course, her. Christmas song, Rock Around the Christmas Tree, has been the number two song. <laughs> well, it was number one until Mariah Carey came Mariah out. Mariah Carey's <laughs> one, exactly. So uh, well, She's a sweetheart. She's yeah. a wonderful person. She's just as nice as she can be, like a sister. But recently, you had some, some rather, some people might think of unsavory characters, but not everybody would. But you sat down with some, some interesting fellows. Yes, uh, on, this, on this very studio. We had just a couple of guys that referred to themselves, and one of them referred to them as a former mob boss from Philadelphia and Boston, and they were well-known at served time. And, and uh, Rob Baldacci arranged that. He, he happened to know them. And, and, uh, you know, and, and so Rob arranged that interview and, and, and did it with me. I got to tell you, it was... Yeah, it was a one. It was, I, how, how do you describe it? It was an incredible experience because you're, you're asking the tough questions. Right. And I uh, and you know, for those of us that are in our 70s, one of the most incredible bank heists in history, of course, was this Isabella Stewart Gardner. Right. And it's still a mystery. They don't know who did it. Right. They don't know where the right. paintings are. Yeah. And so I'm sitting there with them, and I said, "By the way, I just got." Uh, and I I say that Isabella Stewart Gardner, and they they start laughing. And and we get into the fact that they yeah they you know they're, they're pretty sure they have some, some inkling of <laughs> who you know tell me everything but I just thought it was amazing because I had always wondered to myself well, does anybody know and uh, was that and and uh, plus they uh, they were quite uh, descriptive of their involvement in in Maine and New England back and it, which was ancient history for some people, but for me, the 90s are not that far back. Wasn't that far, far back, back to me in my mind. So, but you weren't at all worried about, you end up in the river or anything like that? Oh, geez, like you that. know, I swear to God, uh, Tom Handel on the station said, Gary, I, I said, well, first of all, you know, Rob Baldacci, I don't know if many people know him, but, you know, he's, 
Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to call him a force to be reckoned with, and right. so was, was his brother. I didn't mean that in a nice way. That I, I sort of felt pretty protected. I don't. Yeah, yeah. Let me put it this way. Right. I'm going to be frank with you. I, 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 no, I wouldn't have done that show by myself. Right. No, I, I said to Rob, I said, well, Rob, I, you're going to do, do it with me. And he goes, oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> and these guys have been out of the business for a while. Well, they, they, but yeah. these guys have their own podcast, by right. the way. They're right. already stars in their own right. So coming up here was not like, not like they, you know, like they, 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 this, was, they, this was a step down for them. Right. To come up they, and right. Deal with the Jerry Runlet show. Right. But, but, you said but you, we enjoyed it, though. They enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, I definitely wanted to talk about your relationship also with Bobby Rydell. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, also a friend that I met on the rock and roll cruise, and, and, and I will, you know, just a, a dream come true for me. When I was in, in school, I, I used to listen to him when I was in high school, and, you know, I, hey, turn the radio up in my fr uh, right now. And then I always wanted to be friends with Frank Sinatra, and uh, to me, I, the, the dear God uh, said, I, yeah, you're too old. I'm going to give you someone your age, and that would be Bobby Rydell, who's 80 uh, this m next coming month. And I, I'm right now working on a, on a project uh, for him that we hope will, will, will take place, which will be a musical about his life, like the Jersey Boys and the Buddy Holly story and the Tina Turner and Dion's got one going now. And Neil Diamond's got one going. And uh, his uh, story is definitely one that would make a great musical. He had a lot of hits. And, and, and the, the big thing about his life was that he, uh, he had organ transplants. And uh, you know, uh, survived through those organ transplants and came back on stage, back to sell out shows in Vegas, back to sell out shows on the cruise ships, and, and down in South, and, and, and uh, as the uh, Golden Boys of Bandstand. Golden Boys. And uh, here he is uh, with Frankie Avalon and Fabian, and I also know Frankie Avalon, I've, I've been backstage with him. And, but Rydell is a story unto himself, and I, I texted him last night, and he's, he's the most, most responsive person to me in text in terms of time response. Like all the people I know, he usually gets back to me within a minute. He gets right Which, back to so you. So to me, that <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun to know him, because he is very much Frank Sinatra-like. He is treated like Frank Sinatra. He acts like Frank Sinatra, because they were friends. I don't mean a copycat, but I mean he has that Italian bravado, and, and he loves people, and people love him, and he's an icon, he's on the, the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and uh, to me, uh, I'm just very honored to know him, and, 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 but I was introduced to him by a dear friend, Bob Kulik of The Happenings, and Bob Kulik is a, is a best friend, and you know, he's the one that actually got me into that club, so I have to pay homage to Bob Kulik, because he's the one that brought me into the inner circle. It's a good club to be in. Uh, yeah, I've always wanted to be there. And then they, well, yeah, I met him, and we became friends. And, and uh, he said, you want to come backstage? And there was a letterman and the tokens. And the next thing you knew, I was, I was, I was uh, in the club. It's a kind of a fun thing, because in, in a minute, we're going to talk about the, another upcoming uh, legal procedure that you're involved in. It's not as fun as that one, no. but it's going to be important. We'll, talk, we'll save that for a minute. That's okay. the Waterville case. Uh, but I did want to talk to you about your involvement over the years in the senior games. That's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, another dream come true. When I was in high school, I ran track, and I was captain of my track and cross-country team, and then went to Bowdoin and ran track, and I had a mediocre career there, you know. And, and then uh, yeah, I ran distances, and you know, then in the 2001, I switched to the sprints, and I got a trainer, and I started running the 100, and the 200, and the 400, the fast races. And I liked those a lot. I always wanted to do that anyway, and 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 I ended up winning a lot of state titles in here, in New Hampshire, and and uh, some national titles. And I got a, a, a silver world medal in the Huntsman World Games and the Huntsman World Senior Games. I got a silver medal in the 200. And I just started enjoying it very much. And then in 2015, I was in the first class of inductees of the Maine Senior Games Hall of Fame, which was an unbelievable dream come true. <laughs> it's just I always wondered in high school. I was not. I wasn't that great in high school. I was. You know, again, I was okay, but not great. And I was wondering what it would really like to be considered like good enough to be in a Hall of Fame. And so I ran a. a, a so I'm still very much involved in the in the senior in, games. In the senior I, games. I, I, I'll, I'll be sponsoring the track meet that's going to be held at St. Joe's. So I've been either the state champion or a medalist for the last 21 years. But I've been beaten by some very very good men. In the last race I ran, I got 
a, go a gold, a silver, and a bronze, and the guys who beat me, one had just had a heart, heart operation, like, I don't know, four months before, another one had spine surgery, and another one had survived cancer, and those were the three of the guys who beat me. <laughs> that beat you, right, yeah. exactly, and that's That's crazy. how good they were, well, I'm not right. how good they were, how bad I was, but I'll tell you, that, that's a story unto itself, I thought. So I, I wanted to also just talk about, it's a little more serious of a case, the case that you guys are working on about the missing child in Waterville, I know that's... Yes, about 11 years ago, a little more than 10 years ago, a little girl uh, was missing out of her home in Waterville, it was national news for many weeks. Uh, the uh, Attorney General investigated that case. They had forensic people from all over the United States come here, like the best of the best. They could not find uh, the body of the child. There's been, there was alleged that she was kidnapped, but the police investigated that aspect. And the bottom line is that we, our firm has brought suit in that case against individuals that we think, uh, that my, that we think are responsible. And uh, I, I don't do much of the discussion about it. My partner, Bill Childs, is in charge of the case. Right, right. And, uh, but there's a wrongful death action and other actions involving other people that, that we, that we, that we uh, believe evidence points to the fact that people n knew what happened to that child and that they failed to provide uh, the, the right evidence. So, uh, and uh, so that's going to be a civil trial, not a criminal trial. Right, a civil trial. This is not, there'll be no guilty verdict or anything of that nature. It'll be, did, did, did these, these people have any involvement in, in what happened to that child? And our client is, is, is the mother of the child. Yeah. And is, is she's lost a child who would be uh, uh, like 12 years old or something, I think, uh, around now. This case has been going on for a long time. And... You know, I, but you know the one thing that you'll never hear or shouldn't hear any anybody do when they're talking to the press is to posture and say, "Oh well, you know." I mean, some people do that, but I, it would, would be inappropriate uh, for me uh, to discuss you know, where this is going to go and what's going to happen with it. It is very much in the, in the sort of not the beginning stages of the process, but it's in. Uh, and there's a, uh, there's a lot of, lot of work involved, but thank, thank you for asking about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I find it, I think a lot of people find it to be very interesting. Well, it's, it's going to be national news. Uh, that we know. I mean, we're already aware that this case is going to be national news, no matter what the, the happens here. It's the way it is, because uh, it was then. And, you know, the, and people are always, 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 always concerned about missing children that are unaccounted for. Right. It's a very strong thing that, um, uh, that, they, that uh, people in, in, in not just Maine but throughout the country are very concerned when they what happened to that child and uh, you know uh, uh, with all the things that go on they, and people just want to know you know did an accident happen did a, what right, happened to that right, child right and uh, it's so yeah and, and so having some kind of a closure is the most important I have thing. to say how many times have you heard that word but I, I didn't want to th throw out a cliche right, and, right. And, and and again I, I I'm I'm uh, only the, the uh, uh, spokesperson for uh, for my firm in general I'm not a spokesperson for my partner who's in charge of this case uh, believe me he knows what he's doing and uh, I hope hope to take part in the case and continue to take part but I'll tell you it's uh, and see, this is this is no uh, again as I said no earlier. This is not a walk in the park right. here. This is not uh, you know we're, we're not out here j just to have a good time here. This is a serious business. And speaking of closure and closing the book, let's close this interview by talking about your books. You've written a few books, and I yes. And I think, <laughs> well, my first book was a law book about personal mm -hmm. injury cases, and it's called Maximizing Damages in Personal Injury Cases. It's basically how to handle an ordinary case that you have. It, it's uh, it, of uh, not uh, catastrophic. They're different when they're catastrophic. But this is the ordinary case. You know, the, the cases you hear about, and people get some injuries, but they recover. Uh, and I wrote that book in 1991, and then they wanted 26 supplements. So it, it, wow. it's it's okay. a long, it's a big, it's a thick book. It started out selling for 60 bucks, and now it's like I don't know, 500 or something. But wow. I'm very proud yeah. of that because it has o over two million dollars in sales. Right. That's but not the good. reason I'm proud of it, because the irony of it is when I first wrote it, my law partner says, "How much, how much money do you think this book will sell?" I said, "I don't know, 5,000." Well, it's ended up being two million. So. Right. And the other book is about my daughter and myself. Uh, it's called Full Circle: A Father's Journey with a Transgender Child. And uh, that book's on Amazon, and this is about her transition from male to female. And 
because now she's now has moved to Maine, so that there's another chapter. She's now living five miles from me. It's fantastic. Five miles. Oh, it's okay. like the you know it's the yep. greatest epilogue of forever book ever to be written. Did you, when you were growing up, did you think that you would be a prolific writer like this? Or oh, this I swear, I, I, I hope so, but I didn't yeah. know. I, I wrote Murder Mysteries when I was at college. <laughs> and Luigi, I sent them off to like every magazine, Alfred Hitchcock, whatever, and they all came back rejected. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I now read them now, and I realize I, you know, I, 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 they went that good. I, think it, I, I write better now, I, and I write articles for the, uh, uh, Kate Curiel, and I read articles for some magazines sometimes. Look for Derry on PMC, Channel 5. Uh, is there any different times to find you? Or They're all over the place. All yeah, over. Yeah. You can find them anytime as well as <coughs> online. Check out Derry's books, Full Circle, and what was the law? Well, they're not going to want the personal injury guy. But but unless you, <laughs> if you're a lawyer, if you happen to be a lawyer, <coughs> check out the book about law. But otherwise, definitely check out Full Circle. Look for Derry. I want to thank you very much hey, for your thank time, you. Derry. Yeah, it was great you. talking to you. Yeah, same here. Take care, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks a lot.